Hey, this is Mrs. Reichelt, and we are moving into our skin appendages. So let's go ahead and start out by talking about all the cutaneous glands are exocrine glands. Do you remember what exocrine means? Hopefully you're saying that you're re it's, it'll be releasing secretions to skin surface. Um, so secretions to to skin surface. So exocrine, it's going to release outward. Endocrine, it's going to release inward. Um, so there are two major forms of cutaneous glands. The first are called the sebaceous glands. And then the second are sweat glands or sudoriferous. Maybe I'll write this word D O R I F or sweat glands. There we go. So we have sebaceous glands and sudoriferous glands. Both of these are formed by stratum basal. Okay, so then our other skin appendages we have. So we have glands is one, hair hair follicles, and nails. So we're going to talk mostly about um, glands, and then we're just going to touch really quickly on hair, hair follicles, and nails. So the sebaceous glands are going to be oil-producing glands. So if we look at this diagram of a skin model, the sebaceous gland is right here. So it's going to be on the sides of a... Um, hair follicle. So they're going to produce oil. Oil is, we better define what makes up oil. Um, oil is going to be a mixture of sebum and fragmented cells. Oil has several purposes. The first, it's going to lubricate the skin. In addition, it'll prevent brittle hair. And lastly, it kills bacteria. And most have ducts that are going to empty directly into hair follicles. See this sebaceous gland, how I kind of outlined it? It'll, it will um, exit directly into the hair follicle, which will be released on the skin surface. Um, and then glands are activated at puberty. Um, before I guess we move, maybe I should go through. Sebaceous glands are going to be found everywhere except soles of feet and palms of hands. But other than that, sebaceous glands are going to be found everywhere else. So let's go through a couple of homeostatic imbalances of the sebaceous glands. The first you have, we have our whiteheads. Whiteheads are going to appear if the gland is blocked by sebum. So then a blackhead on the other hand is going to be when the sebum is oxidized and dries out. And then seborrhea is also called cradle cap, but that's when, um, so I'll guess Cradle cap, it's almost like dandruff, except for it's not. It's very common in infants, but it's when they have flaking skin off on their scalp. So now let's move on into the sweat glands. What's the other word for sweat glands? Sudoriferous glands. So I'm going to just write that one more time. 
Okay, so the, the purpose of sweat glands is to produce sweat. Um, sweat is widely distributed within the skin. Um, there are two types of sweat glands. You have an eccrine gland and you have an um, apocrine gland. The eccrine glands are going to open directly to the skin surface. So let's look at our skin diagram and this right here is going to be a great eccrine gland. So it's going to empty directly onto the skin surface. Um, let's see here. The eccrine gland is more numerous. And the purpose of the eccrine gland is that it's going to be heat regulating. So you'll sweat more through your eccrine glands if you're really warm, okay, to help your body cool off. Um, and you have more numbers of these. Um, the apocrine glands or the apocrine glands, um, these are going to be ducts that empty into hair follicles. So it's going to look similar to the sebaceous gland except for it still looks like the eccrine gland is just going to be wrapped around a hair follicle. And these are usually located in the axillary and genital areas. They're going to contain a fatty acid and hormones secretion. So what's actually secreted in the apocrine or the apocrine glands are fatty acids and hormones. And the function is unknown. So we don't know why it um, why you have these glands. However, we do know that they're activated under stress. So stress is an activator and pain's an activator. There's a couple others, but those are the big ones. Um, so those are the, the sweat glands. You have the eccrine gland and the apocrine or the apocrine gland. So let's go ahead and talk about sweat and its function. So the composition of sweat it's made up of mostly water. In addition, there are salt and vitamins. And it also contains some metabolic waste. The metabolic waste that it contains is going to be things like ammonia, urea, uric acid. So notice that all most of these here are acidic. Um, and then the fatty acids and proteins are going to be secreted in the apocrine or the apocrine glands. So the major function of sweat, there's actually three major functions. Um, the first is that it's going to help to dissipate heat. So it's going to help in thermal regulation. The next is it's going to excrete waste. And then lastly, the acidic nature. So if you look at all of this waste that's up here, the acidic nature helps to inhibit bacterial growth. So the odor that you smell when you're using your same gym shirt for two weeks in a row, the smell isn't actually your sweat that's smelling. The smell comes from the bacteria that's um, feeding off of um, the, the byproducts of the sweat. Okay, so let's go ahead and move into hair. Hair is produced by the hair follicle. It consists of a hard keratinized epithelial cells. So if we look here, we have lots of hardened cells. Then the melanocytes are going to provide pigment for hair color. Uh, the hair follicle, better talk about this a little bit, is a flexible... epithelial structure and it's enclosed I guess at the root 
in addition here, well, I guess let's see here. We'll go, go to the next slide. We have some hair anatomy. So the central medulla is going to be the innermost part of the hair. The cortex is going to surround the medulla, so that's going to be this lighter tan color. And then the cuticle is on the outside of the cortex, and this is the most heavily keratinized. The cortex is a single layer of cells, and it sort of looks like shingles on a house. So it's shaped like shingles on a house. And then the cuticle, the cuticle is, again, the most hardened. Whoops, I gotta make sure I didn't do something. Okay, good thing I didn't skip a slide there. Okay, so the associated hair structures, you have the hair follicle, which is made up of dermal and epidermal sheath. And a sheath just means it's a covering. Okay. In addition, the erector pili muscle, so this is the erector pili. The erector pili has a couple of functions. Well, first of all, it's made up of smooth muscle. Do you remember some characteristics of smooth muscle? It's involuntary. It's not striated spindle shaped. Okay, so the erector pili is made up of smooth muscle and it's going to pull the hair upright when cold or frightened. Um, some other hair structures are sebaceous glands and sweat glands. So if you have glands that are wrapped around um, the hair follicle, then it becomes um, a hair structure. Nails. Okay, so everybody has nails. Nails are those scale-like modifications of the epidermis. They are heavily keratinized. That's why they're so hard. And the stratum basal extends beneath the nail bed and the stratum basal is responsible for the growth. Uh, the lack of pigment in this area makes them colorless. And then our last part of our nail structure talk, or I guess our um, skin appendage talk, is the nail structure. You have the free edge, which is this part of the nail, or I guess it's labeled right over here. You have the free edge, which is the same as right here. Okay, the body is the visible attached portion, so the body is going to be all right here, or I guess right here. Okay, the root of the nail is embedded into the skin, so if we look at the root, this is where we go under the skin, and we're in that stratum basal section. Okay, and then the cuticle is the proximal nail fold that folds into the um, nail body, so the cuticle is right here and right here. Alright, so that wraps up our skin appendages.